Grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. In the name of the one who came from heaven, for you and for me, your brothers and sisters. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. A picture is worth a thousand words. How true that is. For example, uh, I don't know if you've been to a wedding lately, but some weddings have different pictures that are worth a thousand words in the ceremonies. One of them I, I've seen often is that before the service, three candles will be placed on a stand or, or maybe even on the altar itself. Before the service, the mothers will come up and they will each light one of the side smaller candles. And then after the vows have been spoken and the blessings have been pronounced, then during the service, the married couple will come forward. Each of them will take one of the smaller candles. They'll light the larger center candle, blow out their own candle, and place it next to it. Okay, so what just happened? Does anyone need any explanation? Not really. No extended explanation needed. The two have become one flesh. There has been a uniting. Their lives are not independent of each other, but they are now married. We have a very clear picture today. One that doesn't need a lot of explanation as we look at another parallel of Lent. An Old Testament picture that shows the, the Messiah of the New Testament and what he would do to be our Savior. Today we're going to look at two scapegoats. We're going to look first of all at the Old Testament scapegoat that, that Aaron had a ceremony with. And then secondly, we're going to look at our own scapegoat. We had read about that Old Testament scapegoat in our, our Old Testament reading before. Those events that we described took place on what was called the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, that was the, the highest religious day of, of, of the year. There were many, many things that were taking place all day long. And one of them was a point where Aaron the high priest selected two goats, perfect goats. And he cast lots to see which one the Lord wanted for what. And he took the first goat and he offered it as a sacrifice. He offered it as a burnt offering, and he splashed his blood and sprinkled his blood in, in ceremonial ways. We had that picture last week. Last week we looked at the high priest and the sacrifices he made and how that foreshadowed Jesus. It's the second goat that we're concerned with today. That second goat was called the scapegoat. In the scapegoat, Aaron would take it, he would present it before all the people. He would then lay both of his hands on the goat's head, and he would confess sins. Confess sins of the nation. Confess the many sins they had committed against their God. After he was done in that elaborate confession, the goat was given to a man who was specially selected for that day. And that man would take that goat outside the camp, and he would release it out into the wilderness. Now, goats are not the most cunning, savvy Creatures. So what would happen to that goat? It would be lost forever. It would perish. It would be gone. Some wild animal would devour it. It would not exist out there in the wilderness. It would be gone forever. Any questions? That's the picture. And it was a clear picture of what exactly was supposed to happen in the Old Testament as I looked ahead to the Messiah who was coming for them. Now, there were many other Old Testament verses that spoke about this principle that God was trying to teach them in a visual way. For example, Psalm 103 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 1, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Micah chapter 7, you will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Jeremiah 31. The Lord says, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Jeremiah 50. In those days, at that time, declares the Lord, search will be made for Israel's guilt, but there will be none. And for the sins of Judah, but none will be found, for I will forgive the remnant I spare. And the Lenten verse, Isaiah 53. 
He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Any questions? What a clear principle that was in what God would do in Jesus Christ. You know, when things go wrong, it is natural to look for a scapegoat, isn't it? When the basketball team has lost a gut-wrenching, emotional game, people at the end of the game, they begin to look back and they say, boy, who, who missed some free throws? Who missed a couple rebounds that they should have gotten? Who missed a couple layups? They'll even look at the coach. Why was that substitution made in the third quarter? And why didn't they call off the full court press? Everyone's looking for blame. Same thing happens in some types of companies. If something goes wrong in the company, who authorized that? Who made the decision for that? We look to lay the blame on someone, and sometimes satisfaction is not found in a company until someone's fired. Someone has to lose their job over this. There must be a scapegoat. Well, as we look at God's principle of the Old Testament scapegoat, we have to recognize today that goat was never intended to be the long-term solution for our relationship with God. That goat was not the fulfillment, not the complete picture of the scapegoat, but it pointed ahead to the one that we look at this length and the one that we focus on in our readings and our accounts. There are many clear New Testament verses about Jesus who served as our scapegoat. Probably the, the most direct one is what John the Baptist said when he pointed out Jesus to his disciples. He said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or in our uh, New Testament reading we have from 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There has been a substitution and an exchange made. We also have to recognize in, in one of our Wednesday services, we, we hit this pretty directly with Caiaphas, the high priest. An ironic statement that he made that was very prophetic. In John chapter 11, it says, The Jewish religious leaders said, If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. How ironic that the high priest, who was an enemy of Jesus at that time, would make that prophetic statement. How ironic that Jesus would use that office of high priest one more time to teach a lesson that has eternal implications. Jesus Christ took your guilt and your sin and carried it up a hill so that you would never have to see it again. He has borne your sin and he has borne your punishment so that you could go to heaven one day through faith in him. This principle is taught in, in kind of a complicated phrase that Christians often use, one that we have to recognize today as well. Have you ever heard the phrase vicarious atonement? Vicarious atonement. That's, that's one of those phrases catechism kids really struggle to, to learn those long words. This is exactly the picture that we see in the scapegoat this morning. The word vicarious comes from a word vicar. The word vicar means a substitute. A substitute or a representative. Today we also get the word vice from that. Vice in the sense of like the vice president. He's the substitute for the president. If the president can't be there. There's been a substitute. An atonement. Atonement literally means to cover. And sometimes we'll say, well, I'll cover the bill. That means you're going to pay for it. It often comes with a price. Been a vicarious atonement. There's been a substitute payment for you. And that's only come through the Messiah who fulfilled the picture of the scapegoat. Now as we think about that today, your sins being laid on Jesus Christ, one thing that strikes us is the unfairness of it all. Isn't that unfair? God's not fair. Can you imagine, uh, kids, if you're in school, 
Or maybe if you remember your school days, think back to being in school, sitting in class with 20, 25, 30 other people there in the classroom. Can you imagine a day where the students are being rather unruly? Maybe it's a Friday before vacation. They're not being too respectful. They're acting up a good bit. Can you imagine the fairness if a teacher would say, okay, I've had it. If anyone acts up in this room, that person is going to be punished. So stop it. Well, the rest of the class might like that and think that's pretty fun. But one thing they would admit is that that's not fair. We do not normally punish others for the sins of others. Take that a step farther. Let's say that that person the teacher pointed to in row number one is the model student. That's the A student. That's the one who's never been disrespectful. That's the one who's never acted up or talked back. And yet that one is going to be punished. And then let's take that to an unthinkable end. Let's say that the teacher says, if anyone's acting up in this room anymore, that person is going to lose their life. That's unthinkable. That's unimaginable. But look at what God did. What did that goat do in the Old Testament to get picked that day? What did that goat think? What did that goat plan, connive? What wrongs and crimes had he thought of? What is an innocent victim? In the same way, what did the Son of God do to stand on trial before men? What did the Son of God do to suffer your guilt and your shame? Not only do we think, though, of the unfairness of it all, let's not accuse God of being unfair today. But rather, as we look at this picture, let's take a lot of comfort in His grace and His mercy that He shows us in it. That's the point God would take, have us take away from it. Because if we think of those sins that were confessed over that goat, could you ever carry your own sins away? And just imagine that for a second. If he's not going to carry them away in an unfair situation, and you have to carry them away, imagine all of your sins being a marble. All of them being put into a sack. All your words, all your deeds, all those thoughts that have been against what God would have you do. How large would your bag be? At the end. Let's say that they put it right on your back and they start adding them. You're going to carry that away. Could you ever be your own scapegoat and carry away your sins? That thought is unimaginable to you and for me. And so the gracious thought that fills our heart this Lent is what mercy God has on us when we could not pay our debt. And what a comfort it is to see some of those sins taken away. After all, if you were Aaron and you, and you were confessing some of your own sins from your life on that goat, are there some of them you would, be, you would see you know, taken away that you would be thrilled to have me forever? Which ones from your past would you just be jumping for joy? Because they're gone. They're taken care of. And they're atoned for. What a relief, as you just sang before. In faith I place my hand on that dear head divine, as penitently here I stand and lay on him my sin. Yes, as we see that great comfort, what, what's our response going to be in our life now? After all, this has an effect on us that's, that's unmistakable. What are we going to do as we see the scapegoat, as we see Jesus figuratively take away the sin of the world? Are, are you going to run after the goat? You want to chase it down? Do you want to find it again? Going to find some of those sins again? I can't imagine that there was anyone on any of those days of atonement in the Old Testament who, when that goat was released out into the wilderness, just started plodding away in the wilderness. I go, I gotta find it again. I gotta find that goat. I, I don't think anyone ever did that. Would you do that now? Go back to the old ways? Find the old sins? No, this will have an effect on all of us as loving spouses, as hard-working students, as obedient children, as godly parents, as kind brothers and kind sisters, as industrious workers, as honest citizens, and on and on and on. Now, we live now in the comfort and in the, the peace of knowing that our sins have been graciously forgiven by our Lord. 
Finally today, as we close our look at the scapegoat picture of the Old and the New Testament, we have to recognize in the end that this is a very different situation than the world looks at scapegoats in. For example, the world today, when there's been a scapegoat that's being sought, it means the situation has ended very wrong, very badly, and some type of loss. But today, isn't it interesting that because Jesus is the scapegoat, we win. We win eternally. We're forgiven. We're at peace with God. And it ends up in a good situation. Jesus can even take that and turn it all around. So today, may we praise God. Praise God for the picture of the scapegoat that he gave and include Bible verses that tell us very clearly what the Messiah will do for you and for me. And then may the prayer of the hymn writer also be our prayer when he writes, I lay my sins on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. He bears them all and frees us from the accursed load. I bring my guilt to Jesus to wash my crimson stains, white in his blood most precious, till not a spot.